Welcome to this presentation in which we're going to cover chapter 12 of our textbook. Uh, the name of this chapter is Your Responsibilities When Serving Food and Beverages. Obviously this is very relevant if you are the hospitality manager of a bar or restaurant, but it would also apply to a full service hotel that happens to have a, a coffee shop, a restaurant, or room service available to its guests. So very likely at some point in your hospitality career, you're going to be um, involved in uh, this side of the business. So it's useful to know kind of how this area of the law works. So let's get started. This chapter is divided up into three different sections. We're gonna talk about serving food, how we can do that safely. We're also going to talk about menus, what needs to be on the menu and what shouldn't be on the menu. And finally, we'll be discussing probably the most important area of liability that a restaurant or bar experiences, which relates to alcohol and how we can follow the rules about that and save alcohol uh, wisely and safely. So let's get started. Here are the topics that we're going to discuss. I'm not going to go through each one of these. These are available in the textbook and it is a good way to review at the end of the chapter to see if you have actually mastered the material that's in the, in the textbook. Let's go forward and talk about serving food. There's actually two areas of responsibility that we see here that uh, hospitality managers have. One relates to the Uniform Commercial Code, the UCC, and the other is a topic within the UCC, which is the Implied Warranty of Merchantability. Before we go any farther, let's just pause for a second and pull up the UCC. And the UCC is a law that applies in all 50 states to varying degrees. I'm going to go to the Texas statutes. And I'm going to go to the Business and Commerce Code. And I'm going to go to Chapter 2 of the UC, which has to do with sales. And you can see it's called the Uniform Commercial Code and the section is about sales. Um, okay, so let's advance further. We have this concept of merchantable. What is something that is merchantable? Well, let's just double check here and do a search. And we have here um, our section that has to do with the implied warranty of merchantability. And we see a warranty that the goods shall be merchantable is implied in a contract for their sale. If the merchant, if the seller is a merchant with respect to goods of that kind. Under this section, the serving for, excuse me, the serving for value of food or drink to be consumed either on the premises or elsewhere is a sale. So we can see right here that the rules about um, food and drink um, are covered by the UCC in this particular context. We'll see this particular uh, statute pulled up in, in a little bit, but I wanted to show you, you know, take my word for it when I say that this is a covered topic under Texas law and under the UCC. So what do we mean when we say food is merchantable? Well, it means it's suitable for buying and selling. It's suitable to be uh, uh, transacted about. And typically when we're talking about food and drink, we're talking about food and drink that if eaten appropriately, will not make the consumer ill. Now obviously you can eat too much of many types of foods or drink and become ill. Uh, for example, you could drink uh, a judicious amount of liquor or wine or beer and be perfectly fine, but if you overindulge, yes, you will likely become ill. Uh, similarly, with many other food items, you can certainly eat yourself to the point of becoming ill. We're not talking about overconsumption, but we're talking about the, inherently the food not meeting the standards. For example, it might have a salmonella or E. coli, or it may, might be spoiled or sour food. Uh, obviously some food is intentionally sour, for example, um, blue cheeses or something along those lines. But when we're looking at, at foods that aren't supposed to be sour, that because they are um, too old or haven't been maintained to the right temperature, they are likely to cause um, illness. When we talk about merchantability, we're talking about it from the perspective of the merchant here. Let me go back and look at this 
thing right here again. Let's see. A warranty for the goods shall be merchantable is implied that the goods shall be merchantable is implied in a contract for their sale if the seller is a merchant with respect to goods of that kind. Well, certainly if you're a restaurateur or you are a barkeep, um, then you are a merchant with respect to food and alcoholic beverages. And so when you sell those items to somebody, to a consumer, you are vouching, you are giving them an implied warranty that this food is wholesome, it's not going to make you sick, it's not going to have material in it that uh, could cause you to be ill. And um, if you breach that, if you, the barkeep, or you, the um, restaurateur, breach that warranty by providing food or drink that is contaminated or unwholesome, then you have breached this implied warranty of merchantability. So the restaurateur is a merchant with respect to food and therefore is a, an expert with respect to food safety. And here is that statue that I was just showing you and I've kind of identified certain parts of it that might be especially useful to you. Uh, first of all, the item when you say when you are selling the item to your customers, you're saying without saying it, it's implied that the, what, you're, you're, what you're selling to them would pass without objection the trade under the contract description. So if you um, uh, say that you are selling Chilean sea bass and in fact you're selling a completely different fish, um, then that within the trade would not pass without objection because of the contract description that you provided. The fish that you're actually serving might be a perfectly wholesome fish, but it isn't the fish that you are describing. And so you have to make sure that what your description uh, is consistent with what you are actually selling. Uh, there's a section in the textbook that talks about Roquefort cheese and whether that was in fact what the uh, restaurant was serving. Um, in the case of fungible goods, and what the term fungible means is interchangeable goods. You know, if I were to present to you a hundred uh, kernels of unpopped corn, you could probably see differences between each one of those kernels. Some would be uh, browner than others, some would be uh, thicker, some would be longer, uh, some would have this or that imperfection. You could identify the differences. But essentially, at the end of the day, a kernel of corn is, you know, a kernel of corn. Similarly, a pinto bean is a pinto bean. A grain of rice, if it's white rice, is going to be just like any other white rice grain. A grain of brown rice is going to be like any other brown rice uh, grain. Um, and so when we're talking about those items, we're saying the, the, the rice that I'm providing or the um, pinto beans I'm providing are a fair average quality. And they aren't the worst, they aren't the most um, unsatisfactory of that particular breed of items. We're also saying that whatever we're serving is fit for the ordinary purposes. And of course, in this context, we're talking about human consumption. So food that is prepared for, say, um, uh, livestock consumption or dog or cat consumption would not be fit for the ordinary purposes of, of service at a restaurant, for example. And finally, the food conforms to the promises that we have described. And we'll talk more about this in the truth, truth in menu uh, requirements. But if a restaurateur says certain things about an item, then those, those statements ought to be true, ought to be uh, consistent with what the representations are for that item on the menu or what the waiter or waitress says about that particular item. Of course, a big concern that we have with merchantability is going to be a foodborne illness. And of course, pretty obvious what this is. It's illness or harm caused by the consumption of some type of food or beverage. Guess what? Restaurants and bars are held responsible if their guests become ill because of exposure that the guests have had to a particular item of food. Um, and so uh, we, there has to be causation. Obviously, some uh, people who had come to a restaurant get sick afterwards, and it has nothing to do with what they were exposed to in a restaurant. I'll share with you a personal anecdote. Uh, my my uh, family took my son 
uh, I think it was for his birthday when he was about eight years old to um, a restaurant that has also a performance aspect to it. I'm not going to say the name of it, but you can probably guess if you think much about it. Anyway, uh, there's a show that you watch while you eat, and everybody orders, or you don't really order, you just all get the same type of food, and it's designed to uh, create a certain ambiance. Anyway, as you can imagine, the uh, the restaurant facility is designed to produce large quantities of pretty, you know, it, eh, food. <laughs> it's not the best food ever, but it fills you up and it's consistent with uh, the theme of the, of the place. Anyway, um, we ate the food and I think all of us got sick within two or three hours and some of us were quite sick um, with uh, distress, uh, you know, nausea, throwing up, that type of thing. And then once we got that food out of our system, we all seemed to be feeling much, much better. Well, a day or two later, I got an email from that particular business asking me, uh, what, what our experience was, what did we like, what do we dislike about the experience, and so I shared our experiences, both the positive and the negative, talked about we liked this aspect, we didn't like this aspect, but I included a description of the um, uh, difficulties we had with the food and that we think it was caused because of, of uh, you know, some kind of uh, problem with the hy hygiene in that particular restaurant. Well, I never heard anything. That's not a good thing. You don't want to be that hospitality manager. Um, if you don't, if you aren't going to respond to complaints of your guests becoming ill, don't send out surveys because when you send out a survey, you are going to get some of that. Now, some of the times the, the, the person who's sending it to you may be making the story up. Maybe they're thinking, well, if I say we got sick off the food, we'll get, you know, coupons for free meals or whatever. That's certainly a possibility, and I'm not saying you have to give away coupons or anything like that. But if you get advised from one of your guests that, in fact, they have gotten sick, you need to respond to that in a different way than just ignoring it. Let's talk about the ways that food can lack merchantability. There's two tests that we see out there. One test is whether an object is foreign or natural to that particular dish. This is kind of an old-fashioned test. So, for example, if I am eating an oyster and I find a pearl in that uh, oyster, um, it might chip my tooth on it. But guess what? That's not an unexpected thing to have that. Or maybe a bit of the shell breaks off and, and chips my tooth. Well, um, again, something to be expected. It's a natural component to the dish. Um, I might, though, also uh, find that, that maybe uh, in my beans that I'm eating, there's a stone um, or a pebble or something along those lines. That's not natural to the dish bit to the dish. It's not uncommon. Obviously, the machinery that harvests the beans could e easily pick up a stone, and the stone might look like a bean, and so it might not be sorted out, but it's not a natural component to beans to have stones in it. So in one case, you would say the item is foreign and therefore could cause liability. Again, the stone and the pinto beans. But in the other example, the pearl and the oysters, we'd say, no, that's natural and therefore can't result in a claim. Courts nowadays oftentimes find this distinction to be somewhat arbitrary, doesn't make necessarily the best sense. So some jurisdictions have adopted the second standard, which is the one we actually use in Texas. We use the reasonable expectation standard, and we can see it right here, reasonable expectation standard. And as opposed to focusing upon whether the object found is foreign or natural, we instead say, would the guest, and again, we're talking about the reasonable guest. This is an objective standard. It's not talking about a particular guest and what he or she might have been thinking, but what this metaphorical, reasonable, objective, theoretical guest might have thought. So would that guest have the reasonable expectation that the item would be found in the food? Again, is it unreasonable that a stone could be mistaken for a pinto bean? Probably not. Is it unreasonable to think there might be a fish bone in my fish fillet? Probably not. Is it unreasonable to think there could be a pearl in that oyster? Probably not. 
Um, if um, a fish bone is found in my pinto beans, though, that's probably unreasonable, unless I've been told that my pinto beans have been flavored with some type of fish. So let's look at some uh, food serving guidelines or some things to think about as you are managing a kitchen and a wait staff. One is you want to make sure that food temperatures are being followed um, and being measured. Um, what, and you know, of course, this part, part of it is figuring out, well, what temperature do certain food products have to reach in order to be safe? And how are you going to make sure that the uh, staff knows what those standards are, that the staff follows them, and that there is the uh, ability to maintain those temperatures um, as the food is being prepared. You'll also want to make sure that the serving containers that are being used are appropriate. Um, are there um, chips on the plates? Could, could the plates um, uh, chip or have parts break off? Um, are the plates and cups and forks and knives clean or could they have bits of food or bacteria where they clean at a sufficiently high temperature? Are the pots and pans that we're using su sufficiently clean? Have the uh, cooking staff and to the extent necessary, the serving staff be trained about how to pre prepare and present food. Do they know how to wash their hands, for example? If they should be wearing hair nets, do they know how to properly put those on? And are they in fact doing those things? Do they know what to do if they've got a runny nose or they've got to sneeze or things along those lines? Another issue that comes up are, are the guest food allergies. We've recently had a, a tragic story, I think it was in the New York area, where a young child in a preschool who had a severe dairy allergy, his caretakers, and again, this wasn't a, 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 a restaurant, this was a preschool, so it wasn't a hospitality industry, but uh, the, the caregivers there fed this young child a uh, grilled cheese sandwich. Obviously, cheese is a dairy product, and the the young boy um, consumed it. Obviously, he's just a little boy. He doesn't know what he can and cannot eat, and it killed him. He died as a result of this. Um, sometimes food allergies are that serious. Many times, for example, peanut allergies can be that serious, and so it becomes very, very important that uh, restaurants be uh, aware of what goes into their dishes and that when they have a guest with a severe allergy that they are accommodating that guest to the extent that they can and if they can't accommodate that guest that they make that clear that they're not able to accommodate that guest. Other food allergies may not be so severe but they may cause the guest great discomfort. For example, um, a, a guest who is, is, has celiac disease he or she is not likely to die as a result of getting um, some type of wheat or gluten into his or her system, but he or she may have a great amount of discomfort, days of being sick as a result of getting that gluten. Obviously, that's not what we want to put our guests through. It's not good for our customer relations, and it's not good from a human-to-human -human perspective. Um, so we do need to um, educate ourselves as to these types of issues and more importantly, educate the people who are taking the orders and who are processing the orders. Sometimes people think that people who complain of food allergies are exaggerating or uh, they have misidentified what their allergy or their substance is. Uh, the takeaway is that while, yes, I'm sure that happens, the more important thing to keep in mind is we don't know what's going on medically with that person. We ought to take them at their word and uh, not worry about whether they really have this illness or whether it really is severe or not. It's a good idea to disclose potential allergens to guests. Um, certainly when the guest inquires, that's very appropriate, but sometimes even when the guest doesn't um, inquire. Now we've all seen silly postings that say, you know, you know, let's say it's a jar of peanut butter and it says contains peanuts or it's um, a jar or a, a, a bag of pistachios contains nuts you know or something like that obviously um, certain things probably don't need to include allergy warnings when it's obvious what the item is but in other cases it is crucial that we let our, our guests know about what's in the item if one would not ordinarily think that you know, peanuts for example would be in that dish 
we need to go ahead and inform the guests of that particular issue. Okay, well, I gave the example of my family's trip to the restaurant where we became quite sick, um, and I said that the restaurant didn't respond to us in any way. But this is what should have happened. That restaurant, we'll say that restaurant was called, um, let's see, we'll call it um, um, Knights of the Round Table. Knights of the Round Table restaurant. Um, what they should have done once they found about out about my my complaint, my email, is they should have um, f uh, made sure that they kn knew the date and the time that we were at the facility. I think there were a couple different seatings for that. Find out what we ate, and again, that's pretty easy because at this particular restaurant, everybody I think gets the same food, or maybe there were two choices. And uh, they should have inquired as to whether we saw the physician and what tests, if any, were conducted to confirm that it was a, a foodborne illness. Again, none of that happened. That was poor from a customer service standpoint, but it was also poor in terms of, of um, managing the legal risk for that particular restaurant. If it seems that there is a serious foodborne illness issue, then you'll want to um, make sure that the appropriate authorities on the county level are informed about that particular issue. And as always, when you encounter a problem like this, you need to you know, certainly address it at the time that it arises, but also try to think about how you can do better next time. What were the fails? What were the, the glitches that we had that has resulted in the illness um, happening? And so um, learn from that, improve training, um, change and tweak methodologies. And of course, you want to document those efforts. You'll want to, um, if you have additional meetings with staff about maybe the issue was that the food wasn't kept at the right temperature or that the food wasn't cooked uh, sufficiently or something along those lines, you'll want to document that you have um, retrained the staff, maybe set additional checks in place to ensure that the issue doesn't arise again. And again, when the problem is severe enough, where enough people are sick or the illness becomes severe enough, you want to uh, get your attorney involved and um, other officials within your organization involved. So that's an overview about serving food. Let's talk about truth in menu laws next. Um, lots of different names for this, but the idea for these types of laws are that what you say you are serving to the guest is what you need to be serving. And so many of these terms have defined terms. Some don't, but some of them do. And so the, the guiding principle ought to be when you are uh, drafting your menus or when you are preparing, say, your specials, that you describe the food accurately that you are going to be serving to your guests. And this can raise issues in several different respects. Here are some of the ones that we can have. One can be preparation style. Are you steaming it? Are you poaching it? Are you frying it? You want to make sure that whatever word you use to describe it is in fact what you're doing. Then you'll want to make sure that you're describing your ingredients correctly. Um, if it really is Chilean sea bass, well, that's great. But if it's some other fish and you think Chilean sea bass sounds better or you can charge more for it, that's not okay. You need to make sure you describe the fish that you're actually serving. If you're not actually, if there's no Roquefort in your Roquefort dressing, then you probably shouldn't call that, you definitely shouldn't call that dressing Roquefort dressing. Um, maybe there's some Roquefort and some other stuff. Well, you probably can get away with calling it Roquefort then. Where does the food originate from? Is this um, Alaskan halibut or is this some halibut from somewhere else? You don't usually have to say where it came from, but if you say it's Chilean sea bass, well, that sea bass probably should come from Chile. And that um, halibut, if you say it's Alaskan halibut, should come from Alaska. Size of the portion obviously is important. This is obviously something we see commonly with steaks. If you are saying that you're giving someone a 12 ounce steak when really it's only 10 ounces, that's a problem. So you want to make sure that you are accurately describing the size of the meat. Now, um, 
I guess the question come up is, is this the pre-cooked size or the post-cooked size? And uh, that may be something at least your, your server should be aware of and know how to respond to if such a question arises. It's not unusual for menus to describe the health benefits of certain foods um, or certain preparation styles. And you want to make sure that you're following the rules with respect to that, as well as generally through uh, nutrition, nutritional statements that you make. So let's go into some of these topics in a little bit more detail. We're going to first of all talk a little bit about the health benefits. We not infrequently see terms like low fat. This is the low fat dish. Or this is the heart healthy dish. Or this has high fiber. Or this is light. This is the dieter's delight or whatever. Um, generally speaking, restaurants don't have to disclose whether the food is good for you or not. They don't have to disclose calories, although um, there is definitely the possibility, especially that chains may have to do so at some point. Um, if a restaurant chooses to disclose nutrient information, then they have to make sure that they're following what the FDA, which of course is the Food and Drug Administration, what those regulations are. So if I'm not calling an item heart healthy, then I don't have to worry about that. But if I choose to use the term, I need to make sure that those terms, I'm using them as those terms are defined by the FDA. And sometimes the definitions the FDA comes up with are not necessarily what the restaurant might have been thinking about. And so you have to think that through. Not every term that you see on a menu that has some kind of uh, sense of, of healthiness is a term that is defined by the FDA. But if you are going to use those terms, it definitely makes sense to confirm whether it's one of those terms that we need to use. And again, this is very common. Uh, people who dine in restaurants like to get information like this. And so uh, studies indicate that over half of all menus contain some of this information. Therefore, it's quite likely that you will uh, be managing facilities who are making some of these claims. And you'll want to make sure that when we say one of these terms or when your restaurant says one of these terms that it can support that and you will want to uh, hold your your chefs or whomever prepares the menu uh, accountable for making sure that those are defendable terms according to the definitions by the FDA. So we talked before about um, preparation style in general terms, but let's look at it more specifically. Here are some very specifically defined terms. So when we call food grilled, we mean it literally has been on a grill. It doesn't have some kind of uh, mechanically prepared grill marks on it. Um, so it doesn't, when we say grill, we don't mean it looks like it was grilled, but it never really was. No, it actually has to have been on a grill. When we call something homemade, obviously, um, you're not, your restaurant isn't in a home. But what we mean is it's made on the premises, on the quote unquote home of the restaurant. So if you're buying, say, your desserts from another business, you can't call it homemade under those circumstances if it's coming from the other business. That other business, if it also sells its own items, it can sell that same item as a homemade item, but once it sells it to you, it can no longer be called a homemade item. So what does fresh mean? Well, it means that it's not some other uh, mode of storage. It's not uh, frozen or canned or fresh or processed. Now, it may be at the end of its uh, peak uh, desirability. The lettuce may be a bit wilted. Uh, the expiry date may be coming up very soon. So you're not making an, a statement about when it was picked, but you are saying that none of these processes have been applied to it. Let's take the term breaded shrimp. Um, this term refers to a particular type of shrimp. There's lots of shrimps out there, but this is the, I, I, I did not actually write down the name of the shrimp, but this is a type of shrimp that is commonly consumed by human beings. But there are other types of shrimp that aren't commonly uh, consumed by human beings. And so when we use this term, the assumption is it's one of those commonly consumed by human beings fish. We see two terms used with respect to kosher. We see kosher style. These are items, well, let's first of all talk about kosher. Kosher refers to um, methods of preparing foods that are consistent with the dietary rules of the Jewish religion. Um, these rules uh, have uh, spiritual and other significance to people of that particular faith journey. Uh, they involve issues relating to how the animal is butchered, 
how the animal is killed and butchered, and how the food can be prepared, and what the food can be paired with. For example, just some obvious ones are uh, a kosher um, food item can't include shellfish. It can't include dairy and meat, for example. It can't include a, a cheeseburger. Um, it can't um, include pork, for example. In addition to the preparation style, there's also additional rules about kosher uh, de designation. For example, a Jewish rabbi needs to be uh, certifying that all the kosher rules were complied with in the preparation of this deal, meal. So that would be the kosher rules. And again, if you um, uh, uh, are going to a grocery store, there are certain signs you can look for on the packaging that indicate, yes, this is in fact kosher. Um, this is an important thing for many people of the Jewish faith, and also rules are somewhat different, but they're very similar for people of, uh, who are followers of Islam. Uh, they call it halal as opposed to kosher, but many of the rules are very similar. So let's compare the term kosher with the term kosher style. These are foods that are prepared in the style of kosher foods, many times reflecting the Eastern European and Middle Eastern uh, taste palettes that we see in much of kosher cooking. But they aren't necessarily religiously kosher. For example, the animal may not have been slaughtered consistently with kosher law, even though the, the end product tastes the same as it would if it were prepared in a kosher manner. So for example, kosher style would mean no cheeseburgers, no shrimps, but it would not necessarily meet the demanding standards of kosher food. Um, so that's kind of a comparison between the two um, terms. So obviously this one would be someone who enjoys the cooking traditions of the Jewish, Jewish community, but is not necessarily an observant Jew. The term kosher would be more applicable to somebody who is an observant Jew. And of course, you can cook many, many types of food in the kosher style. You could cook Chinese food in the kosher style or Indian food in the kosher style um, in terms of complying with these rules. Um, even though the food itself would not particularly taste uh, as if it were part of that Jewish tradition. And so even though it truly is kosher, it might not really um, suggest the kosher style because the, the flavors would be more consistent with um, the other kosher cultures, the Indian culture, or the Chinese culture, or whatever the culture might be. Uh, switching from kosher to ham, that's kind of interesting that, that our, my two kosher choices are sandwiched between two things that are very unkosher, which are which is shrimp and ham. Of course, ham is a, a pork product, a product of the pig. And whenever you call a ham a baked ham, it has to be something that is prepared in an oven. That's, of course, we bake things in an oven. So these are just some examples of how um, there are meanings associated with these terms that do limit the business in how they're going to describe the foods. Okay, so now we're done with our first two topics, which are how we serve food in order to maintain its wholesomeness and the safety of our guests. And we've talked about how we describe the menu items so that we are giving the guests the information that they need to know to make wise choices for themselves. And now we're going to talk about probably the most important topic with respect to uh, food safety, and that is alcohol rules. This is obviously a really important topic because alcohol can be a very dangerous substance when used to excess. Most of us know that alcohol is a drug and it is a depressant. What is a depressant? Well, this is a substance that lowers or depresses the rate of vital body activities. We're not saying that it makes you depressed in the sense of it makes you sad. Obviously, alcohol can have lots of different effects on a person's um, demeanor. Some people become sleepy, some people become agitated, some people get happy, some people get sad, some people get uh, belligerent, lots of different reactions. But we do know whatever the uh, reaction that a person has, on some level their body is uh, lowering the rate of its vital 
things, activities. Um, and so it is a, a, there is some level of danger or caution that is appropriate to think about when we think about consuming alcohol. Of course, each state has its own way of regulating alcohol, and they really, really do significantly vary from state to state. Some states, the only place you can buy alcohol outside of bars and restaurants is through a state-owned um, liquor store. Um, other places, you can buy um, hard liquor in grocery stores. Um, and so there's a wide range of mechanisms to distribute and sell alcohol. Um, ours is um, county-based, meaning that what uh, we don't have a statewide policy. Each county gets to kind of pick and choose what it wants to do. And sometimes it's not even county-based. Um, for example, parts of uh, Collin County have different rules, uh, uh, depending upon what part of the county it is in. Even in cities, there can be differences precinct by precinct. I grew up in a part of Dallas, and our precinct of Dallas at that time was dry. Um, you couldn't even buy beer and wine in grocery stores, although you could buy cooking uh, wine. Um, but other parts of Dallas, the city of Dallas and Dallas County, had differing rules. So again, it can be very specific to a particular area. Obviously, this has a lot of historical implications to it, lots of reasons why we have this. Um, lots of differences between urban and rural and suburban areas. And we can see in Collin County that there have been changes um, in, in the last several years, and these changes continue um, where the, the county is moving to somewhat different rules. Um, and again, there's still local variance between this community and that community. And there's lots of different arguments, both to of pro and con of making alcohol um, more available or less available um, in terms of the types of businesses that come up, in terms of the uh, type of tax revenue they, they raise, in terms of the safety of the population, um, lots of different issues uh, that are worthy of a lot of reflection and consideration. Um, and not all communities make the same choices in this area. As I said before, Collin County is a mixed county. You know, there are some counties that are completely dry and some counties that are completely wet, meaning um, beer and wine and alcohol can be sold uh, you know, widely. Um, and dry means they're not available at all. Um, as I said before, Collin County is mixed, and this is pretty common. There's relatively few completely dry or completely wet counties. Um, the, the usual is going to have some mixed county status. Many times these, these laws make distinctions between beer and wine and liquor. Um, and there is some logic to that. For example, it takes about 12 ounces of beer to have the same amount of alcohol as five ounces of wine, and that compares with about one and a half ounces of spirits of, of hard liquor. I mean, so you can see how consuming, it, it, it takes a fair amount to get really drunk off of beer, but it doesn't take very much at all to get really drunk off of liquor. Um, and so there are some differences in level of intoxication. But, as you can see, um, all of these beverages will eventually get you to the point of inebriation where you can uh, become ill and, again, if you really over and by, possibly even can be fatal. And certainly if you drive and while you're impaired, uh, you and, and others can be at risk. So let's see a little bit about how um, licenses to sell liquor uh, proceed in Texas. So what does a person who applies for such a license, what has to be true about him or her? Well, the first is he or she has to be over 21 years of age. I mean, that makes sense. You can't consume the substance unless you are 21 years of age, so that's probably not surprising. The next is a person must be of good moral character. That sounds like a pretty subjective standard, and of course it is. Certainly a criminal background track should be run on such a person, and if they have um, a criminal background, then they're very likely to not be held to be of a good moral character. Of course, a related idea is, is this person law-abiding? And that, of course, relates to the criminal background check as well. 
And then finally, they have to be legally residing in the United States. So this person, if this person is not a US citizen, that his or her documentation is consistent with his or her presence in the United States. When all of these are satisfied um, and the uh, permit is, is submitted for review, um, or application is submitted for review, Typically, the, the license will issue in about two months, but sometimes it can be longer. Since there are different categories of licenses that are sought, that can affect how quickly the license is issued. And of course, whenever we, turn, we use the term license, this is something that can be withdrawn. This is a privilege, not a right. And so uh, holders of liquor licenses uh, need to be very protective and careful to make sure that they are um, following the rules carefully uh, because they risk losing that license. Let's talk about BYOB. BYOB, of course, stands for bring your own beverage. Um, there are no statewide rules about this in Texas, uh, so it's important to check with the city or the county which your establishment is in if you choose to have a BYOB uh, situation. Uh, Sometimes restaurants will have BYOB while they're in the process of applying for a liquor license. But once they actually have um, a mixed beverage permit or a private club permit, they can no longer allow people to bring in their own alcoholic beverages. Some places choose to remain BYOB forever. They think that's a better uh, mix. They may have a corking fee associated with the BYOB process. Let's talk about some technical terms. One term is blood alcohol concentration, which is also called blood, blood alcohol level. And this is the percentage of alcohol in one's bloodstream. The uh, federal limit that's been established and which is applied as far as I know to all 50 states and certainly in Texas is 0.08% or higher. This is lower than it once was. It used to be 0.1% long, long time ago. Um, but the studies indicated that people who were um, even at 0.08% were significantly impaired and uh, should not really be on the road driving under those circumstances. And so this level is the level that we have in Texas and it's a level that we have throughout the United States. So very likely wherever you go you'll see this level. Now a state could establish even a smaller percentage to be um, intoxicated to intoxicated to, to drive for example so you you would want to double check your state to make sure now of course you as the barkeeper as the restaurateur are not taking blood samples from your guests to see if they've reached that limit so you you have to look to behavior and to the amount of drinks that person has consumed to see what side of this line that they're on. Um, and sometimes behavior is a good indication, but sometimes it, it may not be. Uh, some people, quote unquote, hold their liquor better than others, even though those people who hold their liquor may well be at the legal limit and should not be served anymore. And just because, by the way, a person appears to be holding his or her liquor, that doesn't mean that they aren't a risk to others if they were to drive. Of course, related to the BAL or BAC is the term intoxication. And this is when that person crosses the line into the 0.08% level of alcohol in their bloodstream. When a person reaches that level, when they are by definition intoxicated, they are legally prohibited from buying and selling alcohol and from operating a motor vehicle. And of course, we think about cars and trucks as being the motor vehicle, but certainly a um, motorboat would also be covered by this. So if you are running a, uh, an establishment on the lake, for example, um, and a person has uh, uh, taken his, his boat up to a pier and, and docked it, then that person, if he were to get behind the wheel of his motorboat, would be um, uh, in violation of the law. So it's unlawful for the intoxicated person to buy liquor, but it's also unlawful for you to sell him or her liquor. And so it's a, it's a responsibility of the hospitality manager to make sure that the uh, wait staff and the bartenders in your facility 
are monitoring guests to make sure they haven't crossed that line and that they are still, it's still appropriate to serve those individuals alcohol. Let's talk about liquor licenses. We kind of already talked about that briefly, but let's just talk about it a little bit more. What is a liquor license? Well, it's a permit issued by a state that allows for the sale or service of alcoholic beverages. Um, and of course, there's gonna be different licenses when it is an on-premises consumption, such as at a restaurant or a bar, versus an off-premises uh, consumption. For example, the liquor that you buy at a liquor store or at a grocery store, different rules apply. As I said before, selling alcohol is a privilege, not a right. It can be taken away from you. Businesses that uh, don't exercise good judgment, that overserve their guests, or that uh, run promotions that are not con comply with the law, or that have um, incidents where people are getting into fights and things along those lines. Um, all those are situations that could result in that business losing its liquor license. And oftentimes for businesses to lose their liquor license, it basically means their business is gonna go belly up. Um, I mean, obviously if it's a IHOP, it won't make a difference. I don't even know if IHOPs have a liquor licenses, but there are certain businesses that can survive quite easily without a liquor license, but then there are many others where that is a very, very important part of the business. Many times um, beer, wine, and alcohol sales, even though they may not make up a huge percentage of the business, are a very significant profit center of the business. And so it is definitely a part of the business that you want to jealously watch over to make sure you are in compliance and that your license is not going to be in jeopardy. So who is a licensee? Well, we've seen this before. We've seen these endings with the um, EE here. So this is somebody who receives a license. So the licensor is the state of Texas in our case, and the licensee is the business who gets to serve the liquor. Um, so this would be your restaurant or your bar, the one that you're managing. Here are the rules in Texas for um, when an unlicensed uh, per a place that holds online unlicensed uh, on-premises license or permit can serve. And again, we're talking here about restaurants and bars. So on Monday through Friday, they can do it from 7 a.m. To, to midnight. Not quite sure who's buying uh, beer, wine, or liquor at 7 a.m., but there you have it. On Saturday, it extends to 1 a.m., and on Sunday, it starts at noon until midnight. And again, this, has a, this is a blue law. Um, the idea is you ought to be going to church before you start drinking, I guess. Um, but you can start as early as 10 a.m. if you're also serving food. For example, let's say you're uh, serving a brunch and you want to offer mimosas or bellinis or something like that, um, then that would be something you could do. But you couldn't just serve bellinis or just serve mimosas or something. We do have um, a, a special provision in certain parts of, of a city or a county that allow for late hours. And so in that cir circumstance, if that business has a late hours permit, then they can stay open until 10, 2 a.m. every night of the week. So these times here would change to 2 a.m if that is available in that particular location. You can see how a bar especially would find this uh, desirable because that gives them two more hours on Monday through Friday to sell a liquor. And, and uh, it would cause, it could be if you were in a community such as Frisco that doesn't have this, you might find that the a pub crawling population leaves your bar at midnight and then goes to say a bar in a different community with these late hours for two additional hours. So you're losing out on that commerce. At least that's what uh, some bar owners think. Okay, so let's talk about what the rules are with respect to guests. I think we all pretty much know this. The rules in Texas are, and as far as I know in all 50 states, are that one has to be 21 years old before one can drink alcoholic beverages. There is an exception in Texas that not all states have. In fact, I think most states don't. 
Now, this exception allows parents to allow their minor children to drink. And so if the parents is giving, is giving the minor child a drink, it's okay. So if you um, are waiting on a table and a dad orders a beer and he allows little Johnny to have a sip of the beer, um, you aren't breaking the law by permitting that to happen. The father isn't breaking the law. Um, of course, if dad offers the drink to little Johnny's friend who tagged along to the restaurant, that would be breaking the law. Um, so um, that's a, a little bit of a wrinkle under those circumstances. Um, it's permitted for minors to be in places that serve alcoholic beverages. So um, it could be a, a true bar and people under the age of 21 can be present. Many of these establishments choose to make them adult only. Uh, there can be lots of reasons for that. For one thing, as people are drinking, laying their head down, being comfortable, they may not want to have screaming babies in the facility. So it may not create the ambiance they're looking for to have the, the under 21 crowd. Uh, it also, though, can make it easier for the wait staff to sort through because if people are, are carted at the door, then the bartenders don't have to be as cautious about, oh, wait a second, are you, what, what's your, let me see that ID again. Um, so that can be a reason that you may want to have a house rule that uh, doesn't permit minors in at certain times or into certain parts of an establishment. And those are uh, lawful in Texas. If a person, be it a bartender or a server, makes an alcoholic beverage available to a minor, um, that person is going to be subject to possible criminal penalties. Um, it definitely happens where uh, people are uh, charged for underserving um, uh, guests in a, in a bar or restaurant. It's definitely something that uh, you don't want to get involved with. And if you are the hospitality manager, you want to make sure isn't happening in your facility. These are the age requirements for selling alcohol. And this is the one that we're going to be most interested in. This is premises, uh, on premises, uh, license or permit, again, the bar and the restaurant, the person has to be 18 or over to sell or serve the alcoholic beverage. So you can have a waitress who is only 18 or a waiter who's only 18 or 19 sell or serve the alcoholic beverage, a beverage that he or she would not lawfully be able to consume. But 16 or 17 year olds cannot do that. And so as you are staffing, your wait staff and your bartending staff, you must consider um, the, the age of the people that you're going to hire with respect to that. These other categories are not directly applicable to the hospitality industry, although I suppose there could be some hotels that do a sell, maybe uh, liquor or beer or wine, maybe in a sundry shop or something along those lines. Okay, let's consider the topic of third party liability, especially with respect to dram shop type of, of regulations. So third party liability deals with the fact that um, we have obviously three parties. We've got, we'll call it the bar, we'll call it the guest, and we'll call it the victim. So the bar serves the guest alcohol. The guest becomes very intoxicated. The guest leaves the bar, drives a car perhaps, and hits the victim. The victim, of course, can sell this guest, this person who was drunk and caused the accident. But realistically, the guest may not have any money. So the victim may also want to sue the business, the bar that overserved the guest. And so the question is going to be, is the bar liable for the injuries that the victim sustained because of the guest's poor decision? And according, people can look at this in a variety of ways. One school of thought is, well, the bar didn't make the guest drive intoxicated. I mean, it was the guest's decision to drink that much. Plus, maybe the bar thought that the guest had a designated driver, that the guest was going to call somebody to drive him or her home, or maybe um, Uber home or something along those lines. Um, but then you can also see, well, maybe that's the case, but the bar still shouldn't have served that guest more than that guest was able to safely uh, consume. So there's certainly some responsibility, some wrongdoing on the part of the bar. So let's look at this, uh, this idea, this definition of third-party liability a little bit more carefully. It's the legal concept that holds that the second party, the seller, 
Again, this is the second party then. Second party. To an alcoholic transition, liable for the acts of the first party, the consumer. So here we have the first party. As well as any harm suffered by a third party. That's our victim. As a result of the first party's actions. So in this scenario, the bar didn't do anything directly to the victim. The bar didn't even know the victim. The victim just happened to have been in the wrong place at the wrong time when the guest was driving. Um, one way to manage this is, of course, the Dram Shop Act, which we'll look at in a second. But another way is, is that many times the guest who is involved in these situations is a minor, shouldn't have been drinking in the first place. And, of course, a minor who is intoxicated is probably even at greater risk of having an accident than a more mature, more seasoned driver. Obviously, no one should be driving when they're impaired. <coughs> but uh, minors are still learning how to drive and therefore are not are going to be even at greater risk of, of injury. So uh, we do have pretty significant penalties for minors who drink alcoholic beverages and also for adults who serve minors alcoholic beverages. And these, of course, apply to adults in the bar scenario as well as adults in other situations. Let's consider the topic of a social host. Um, we are not, we in the hospitality industry are not social hosts, although we are oftentimes involved in social hosting situations. Let's say um, uh, somebody's having a birthday party. Let's say you have a BYOB um, uh, restaurant, and so they bring their own wine, and they really get quite, quite happy. And there's lots of people drinking, and maybe some of those people leaving are intoxicated. Well, that social host, the person who organized the incident, he or she is not licensed. There's no uh, official authority that they have from the state of Texas that allows them to provide alcohol. But they're not supposed to have a license under those circumstances because this is just a party. This isn't a business type situation. So what responsibilities does that social host have, whether it's at his home or elsewhere? Well, he does not have a common law duty to avoid making alcohol available to an adult guest. He isn't supposed to, um, uh, he doesn't have the duty to stop serving as we would have in a, um, in a bar situation. The bartender does have the um, requirement to stop serving somebody who's intoxicated. The idea about the social host is that the social host lacks the um, expertise to know when somebody has over imbibed. Also, um, it's a, a more tricky relationship because this is a potentially a family member, or a colleague, a boss who is the guest in the home. And so it can be awkward to say, hey, boss, uh, I can't serve you anymore because you're drunk. Let's look at minor guests. What are the rules for social hosts and minor guests? Yeah, there's a school of thought out there um, that says, well, if it, we, we think that our children are going to drink alcoholic beverages before they turn 21, so maybe the way to handle that is to um, let them drink in a safe environment in our homes. Perhaps that's the reason why it's lawful for parents to allow their children to consume alcohol. Um, but whether or not that's a good policy idea or not, it is fraught with lots of legal uh, peril. Um, so uh, this is how it plays out potentially. Texas law allows an injured party, again, this is that victim, again, where we're gonna have that three-party thing, we're gonna have the social host, which plays the role of the bar in our previous example. Then we're gonna call that guest of the social host, and now we have the victim. So the social host, we're going to call this the minor guest. The guest is under 18. The social host serves alcohol to the minor guest. This minor guest is under 18, so not 19 or 20, uh, but very significantly under the drinking age. And um, assuming the social host is not mom or dad, and the... Um, The, the adult knowingly serves or provides alcoholic beverage to the minor or allow the minor to drink on any property owned by the, the host. 
So in this situation, a social host is providing something to someone to my, to a minor guest under 18 who um, is not his or her child, and then that minor guest goes out and says in a car accident. Then yes, this victim is going to be able to sue the minor guest, but let's face it, minor guest isn't going to have any money, and can sue that social host. As a result, it's a very, very poor idea for a social host to serve alcohol to anyone other than his or her own children if those individuals are under the age of 18. Just too much risk under those circumstances. Let's talk about dram shops. This is a name for a variety of state laws, and we have one in Texas, that establishes that liquor licensee, in other words, that bar or a uh, restaurant, or it could be liquor stores, responsibility, it's third-party liability. Again, we're talking about third-party liability. We're thinking about this term right here. How does it work in Texas? Texas isn't unusual. In Texas, vendors who sell alcohol may be held liable, and again, this could be a bar or a restaurant or a liquor store, may be held liable for an injury caused by a customer if the alcohol was sold or given to a minor under the age of 18. Okay, so this is that under 18. This is similar to what we saw back here with the social host. That's one category. But then we also have the second category. When the alcohol was sold, the ghost was obviously intoxicated to the point that he or she posed a clear danger to the safety of self and others. So it could be that the, the person was a minor or that the customer was obviously intoxicated. Um, either one of these will give the vendor liability to that person injured. If either one of these categories are present, we do need to have one second characteristic present, and I'll call this C, and that is the intoxication was approximate or foreseeable cause of the injury suffered. So we need, need either AC or AB in order for the vendor to be responsible. I'm sorry, sorry, wrong one. AC or BC, excuse me. So we need C for sure, and we need, need either A or B. So all of this comes down to, as I'm sure you can see, the need to train your wait staff and your bartenders about how to um, navigate through this fairly risky endeavor that we're involved in whenever we're serving alcoholic beverages. Um, so one thing you'll want to do as you're considering how to train your wait staff and your bartenders is you want to have some kind of program into effect and you may well want to choose one that is prepackaged. Um, and so if it is a prepackaged one, you want to make sure that it has been given the seal of approval from the uh, par uh, entities within your state that are involved in approving those types of programs. You want to make sure that it also covers the nature of alcohol absorption to the bloodstream that the uh, wait staff and the bartenders that you are training are taught something about the physiology. Obviously, they don't need to become doctors or nurses as a result of this, but um, understanding that there may be some kind of delayed effect that the person consume a drink and then there may be, uh, uh, may take some time before that intoxication actually hits their system and that it's a cumulative effect, um, that type of information needs to be provided. Then, of course, and this is perhaps the most important, is that there needs to be a lot of instruction about how to check for legal identification as well as how to spot false IDs, you know, remove that driver's license from the, uh, the billfold so it can be examined, touched, studied, held to the light, looked at from different angles. The person can be quizzed about, you know, what year were you born? Um, those types of things to make sure, what year did you graduate from high school, those types of things to make sure that the person is in fact telling the truth. Um, want to um, emphasize early intervention um, when you are confronted with the possibility of overconsumption by guests. 
so that um, if the, the we, if you've allowed it to go too far, you're dealing with somebody who's maybe already intoxicated, it may be more difficult to uh, reason with him or her to keep the situation um, on a positive footing. As always, you'll want to be sure that you document whatever training it is that you're sharing with your um, wait staff and with your bartenders. Um, the documentation is to have available in the event that your license comes into question or there is that dram shop claim against you where the claim is that you have overserved. And so under those circumstances, that documentation uh, may well uh, reduce the li likelihood that you will um, have to pay uh, for, for liability under those circumstances. And the documentation may also reduce the chances that you will lose your license. So all of that is really important. And it's not a train once and you're done. It's constant training, constant reminders that this is important, that this is a value that your facility holds highly, and that uh, more important than sales, more important than customers being happy is to making sure that we're complying with this um, aspect of the law and that we're erring on a conservative side. We're not uh, pushing the envelope, so to speak, and serving people who are maybe iffy. So now we have completed all three of our topics. We've talked about how we should serve food safely and what we should do when we get a complaint about uh, food not being safe. We've talked about the, the information that is on the menu and how that information should be accurate. And we've also talked about the rules about selling alcohol. I hope that this information has been helpful to you. As always, if you have questions about the material that we've covered, please feel free to email me or even better, stop by my office hours so we can discuss this information in more detail. I hope this information has been helpful and I hope that you have a great day. Thanks so much for your attention.